Sunday. I just wanted to let you know today that Monica with Colorado Tick, now I'm going to forget, Colorado Tick Borne <laughs> Disease Awareness Association is speaking with us. And she is a fellow Lyme sufferer along with the president and founder of that organization. Um, and just to let everybody know, next month is our big annual event. I don't know if um, all of you are aware of that, or if you're not on the Facebook group, if you would please put your um, email in the comments, we can add you to that. Um, it, it, we do have some great speakers, Jill Carnahan, Dr. Ligner, Dr. Burascano, and then we have Colonel Nicole Malakowski. Did I say that right, Monica? Yeah, yeah. Nice job. Yes. He's a motivational speaker, but also a Lyme sufferer. So if you want to take it away, Monica. All right. Let's see, I will share my screen and get started. I think I will. Here we go. How does that look for everyone? We can see it. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction, Joanne. Um, I'm, I am Monica White and um, co-founder and president of Colorado Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Association. Um, but before I could be that, um, I, I was and still am a, a Lyme patient. Um, My life before Lyme was probably like much of your lives, full, active. Um, I grew up hiking and camping, um, uh, was really active with horses. I was a runner. Um, I worked for the U.S. Forest Service as a wildlife biologist my entire career um, and uh, as a wildland firefighter. So um, life before Lyme was, was a lot different than, than life after Lyme. And uh, Lyme derailed my life and the lives of my children and my husband. I was born um, in New Jersey and I grew up on the East Coast um, in New Hampshire, primarily Ohio. Um, and like I said, camping, hiking, fishing, running, horses, um, you name it outdoors, that was me from the time that I was a little, a, a little girl um, all the way through college. Um, I, I went to the University of New Hampshire and I um, studied wildlife biology um, and wildlife management. And in the whole time I was at the school, um, not once did we hear anything um, about the dangers of ticks or tick bite prevention. Um, and I can recall uh, a particular field trip. Um, I had a very small class. It was a really close knit group, the wildlife group was. And we went to Plum Island, um, a, a nature preserve to learn about deer management and, and ticks, or excuse me, deer management and, and the islanders. And when we were leaving, um, we had two vans and my professor had handed each van a, a jar and said, you know, whoever collects the most ticks will, you know, they'll get ice cream. And I remember doing a tick check on myself and, and on my, um, uh, my roommate who had really, really stark blonde hair. And we could find the ticks on her, but I just thought I had gotten off scot-free. So, um, you know, in my entire education, that was that was the only time I even heard the word tick mentioned in, in all of my education um, at the college level. Now, growing up, I had been bitten by ticks and we thought of them more as a nuisance than, than as a danger. Um, and, and so like I left my college career and, and went into um, the, the career that I, that I entered into with the US Forest Service not knowing anything about the dangers of ticks and tick bites, not on the East Coast, not in, in Colorado where I, I um, worked my entire career. So um, like I said, I was a biologist for the, for the US Forest Service and um, would say that it was relatively healthy my entire life with the exception of a couple of bizarre mystery illnesses that we never, um, 
were able to get a diagnosis for. One of those happened when I was three living in New Jersey. I was hospitalized for um, unknown illness. Um, I remember getting blood taken for about a year and um, they, they never determined what, what had made me sick and I got better. And then again, in college, um, I had another mystery illness and um, same thing. I had an enlarged liver um, and a large spleen. I was fatigued beyond belief. I had fever, chills, swollen lymph nodes, fatigue, um, went through all the tests. I did not have mono. I did not have the flu. I did not have HIV. Um, I don't even remember if I was treated for anything at that point. But again, I got better. It wasn't until um, the birth of my, after the birth of my second child, I had a, a very sudden health decline. Um, and at the same time my health declined, my son's health declined as well. He was about six months old. And that was kind of the beginning of um, a seven and a half year um, journey to to discovering that I, I had Lyme disease and multiple co-infections. Um, during the course of, of that time period, I, I lost my career. I was unable to work. Um, the, the health symptoms that I started with were um, inability to sleep, um, gastric issues, um, anxiety that I've never had before in my life, headaches, um, fatigue, and as time went on, those symptoms got worse. Some symptoms um, came and went, other symptoms um, manifested and, and I just became increasingly debilitated. For seven and a half years, I visited doctors all over um, the United States. Um, I, I had a complication of a neuroendocrine tumor in my pancreas, which we thought might've been the source of my illness. Um, and then after that tumor was removed and after a major surgery, instead of getting better, like everybody expected me to do in my thirties, I started getting worse and symptoms um, quadrupled and kept quadrupling um, the more time that went on. I spent two weeks at the Mayo Clinic um, and, and I know this is probably a very similar story to, to many of you out there, um, going doctor to doctor to doctor um, everybody looking at their own piece of the puzzle, um, but not putting the puzzle pieces together. And so um, it did take seven and a half years to get a proper diagnosis. It took three and a half years to even get a test for Lyme disease. And that's the part that really just um, throws me because I was living in Colorado, regardless of um, where I was born, where I had traveled to, what my profession had been, what my risk levels were, but because I lived in Colorado, I was denied a test for Lyme disease for three and a half years. And it took um, a nurse advocate through my insurance company to even be able to get my primary care doctor to sign off on, on getting an Igenix lab test done. And I had Igenix and LabCorp done at the exact same time. My lab core test came back completely negative. My agenics test came back positive. And I was positive PCR for not only Lyme disease, but um, anaplasmosis. Um, so seven and a half years of debilitating illness, and, and I'm talking bed bound. Um, you know, one day being able to walk outside, the next day not being able to get from my bed to the, to the bathroom. Um, and at the same time I was getting sick, I was noticing things with my children and my husband that um, we would never have figured out had I not gotten my diagnosis. They, um, at six months, my son ha started having what was called acrocyanosis. So it looked like he was having circulatory problems in his, in his limbs um, when nursing, um, an entire arm or a leg would go black for no apparent reason. Um, we had him at Children's Hospital at a year old because he had lymph nodes blown up all over his body um, that needed, uh, they were looking for, for onco oncological, excuse me, I can't get that out, 
um, reasons for his lymph nodes to be inflamed. And you know, fortunately he did not have cancer, but they never figured out what was going on with him. Um, both children with, with different behavioral issues, making it difficult um, for school, um, rashes, sleep issues, night sweats. Um, the symptoms just went on and on and on, but they would come like little, I, because of my wildlife background, I call them spot fires. So there'd be a spot fire here and we'd, we'd you know, chase that down and put it out. And then there'd be a spot fire over here and we'd chase that down and put it out. But it wasn't until I got my diagnosis that like the light bulb went off and we had um, both of my children and my husband at that time um, tested and my entire family was infected with Lyme disease and multiple co-infections that um, really derailed. I mean, that it's the best word I can say, really derailed our lives. Um, work, career, finances, um, social and emotional, um, the full gamut. And um, when we finally got those diagnosis, then we couldn't even find access to care in Colorado. Um, I had to travel out of state for care. So we spent um, you know, all of our savings, um, all of my retirement um, and borrowed money from family and, and sought care in New York with Dr. Daniel Cameron, Ashley, to start with, um, who was able to, to evaluate all four of us and um, get us started in treatment. And we did that for a couple of years until we found a local um, doctor in Colorado to take over our care. And, and the tough part about this is that um, the, um, the belief that congenital Lyme doesn't exist um, was getting in the way with, with our local doctors. So um, because we didn't have an unknown tick bite for my son, like it was hard for them to believe that, that he had Lyme disease. But because of the age that he was when he started getting sick, like I, I honestly believe in, in my heart and in my gut, and at some point maybe we'll be able to prove that, um, that both of my children acquired Lyme disease congenitally and not only Lyme disease, but um, for my daughter, anaplasmosis, uh, for both of my children, uh, Babesia, um, and all of us Bartonella as well. My son had an additional um, complication a couple of years into treatment where we um, had stayed at a rustic uh, lodging scenario. Um, we, we had a, a squirrel visiting us in the kitchen um, every morning when we went to a friend's wedding at this rustic lodge. And um, my son I had a, a relapse, even though we had already started treatment for Lyme, he had a, a significant relapse uh, of infection from tick-borne relapsing fever. And um, further testing for myself, shows that I also had the tick-borne relapsing fever. So the combination of Lyme, tick-borne relapsing fever, Babesia, anaplasmosis, and Bartonella was just incredibly devastating to, to our family. Um, as a whole and as individuals, it, it was really, really tough. Um, for me personally, um, treatment involved uh, IV antibiotics which I received on a daily basis for almost six years. Every time we removed the, um, the IV antibiotics, um, I would relapse and end up back in the hospital. Um, pancreatitis was one of my uh, Achilles heels with Lyme. That's where the Lyme liked to attack. Um, and, and I had spent like seven and a half years prior to diagnosis in and out of the ER um, almost on a monthly basis due to attacks that sometimes were identifiable as, as pancreatitis and other times unidentifiable uh, abdominal attacks. And so um, after a, you know, several rounds of IV antibiotics and every time we removed and every time I, I relapsed, um, my doctor suggested that we um, consider the thought of mold in our home. And 
um, like many of you, like I, we were just overwhelmed. We, we couldn't even begin to wrap our heads around um, another potential uh, thing that we would have to deal with. Um, and so I fought it a little bit. Um, I, I definitely can say I fought it because I just, um, you know, years of Lyme treatment and, and trying to get my head around mold was, was almost too much. But I, I can say today that it's something that we should have done earlier, that it is a huge part in, um, in why we weren't reaching um, remission in our Lyme treatment. Um, the mold had a, a much more significant impact than I could have ever imagined. And so um, when we started investigating our home, um, we did find that we had mold issues in our home that were quite significant um, and then spent another, you know, tens of thousands of dollars remediating our home. Um, and we're in the process of building a new home because in our, our efforts to get out of our existing home, um, every house we tested had mold levels that were worse than our house was at its worst. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's a huge undertaking if mold is part of, um, your illness process. And if it's one that's being ignored, it, it could be what's holding you back from getting better as well. Um, so with, with the remediation, um, and with treatment, um, for mold, my family, each one of my family members saw um, some improvements. My, my husband was probably the easiest to treat um, once he was on board. Um, he, he did about two and a half years of treatment and has done um, probably better than the rest of us. My daughter, um, right behind him, again, with, with treatment for Lyme co-infections and mold, has done better. And then my son and I genetically are very close together. Um, we have been kind of the outliers um, and, and more sensitive to ongoing issues, um, even with treatment. But um, who I am today versus who I was um, prior to treatment is night and day. Like, uh, even with the ongoing issues that I do have, I'm so grateful to be functioning, um, you know, to a point that, that, um, I can have some quality of life back and can help my children and my husband um, as well with their quality of life. Joanne had asked if I would talk a little bit about navigating um, insurance because I can definitely say that access to care was huge for us. Um, and we have a good insurance plan. We, we have a, a federal uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield plan but even with that Federal Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, um, being able to access uh, the doctors we needed, um, the treatments that we needed, um, there were barriers every, every step we went. And I did wanna share some of the things that I've learned along the way in that, you know, if you're, and I, I can only speak to Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, but some of them may, um, crossover to other insurance plans. If you were not using a preferred provider, um, there is a loophole for, at least with the basic plan in Federal Blue Cross Blue Shield, that you can appeal um, for access, it's called a true provider access exception. And that is something that, I, I'm not quite sure how I learned it. It was through trial and error early on, even with Dr. Cameron in New York, um, because we couldn't access a doctor willing to take care of us here in Colorado. I appealed and was granted access to be able to see Dr. Cameron as though he was a preferred provider. So we still had to pay the percentage um, uh, difference in how they were billing, but at least there was some coverage there for that doctor. Um, when we got back to Colorado, I still had the same problem where our provider was not being covered by insurance. And I again applied for that true access exception um, with letters and, and a good customer service representative. 
But that is something I've been able to do um, over and over again now. It helps if you live remotely rather than in a more populated area. But even if you're in a populated area, if you can show that you cannot find a doctor willing to treat for Lyme disease, um, which is very, very easy to do, um, at least Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal will allow you this provider access exception. And I, and I do believe that there are those avenues um, for other insurance plans as well. So the, the take home point is um, don't accept your insurance if you have insurance at face value. Um, push the envelope, appeal, reappeal. My first appeal had to go all the way up to OPM, but after that, it kind of set a precedent for me to be able to access doctors that were out of network and have some of those expenses covered. Um, and I'd be willing to share more details on that later. And we also have a partner that works with us, the medical bill gurus. They do that for their living. So um, they're really experts in, in, in finding those ways to get patients back a lot of money um, because it devastated us financially. I mean, we, we borrowed out of our home. Um, I can't tell you how many times the equity in our home to pay for treatment, to pay for travel, to pay for access to doctors, uh, to pay for the supplements. And um, if, if you are capable of doing those appeals on your own, that's awesome. And if you're not, you know, we have a partner that um, although they charge for their services, I think is well worth getting back some of the money that just keeps going out. Um, and I can answer more questions on that later. Um, I'm still healing. I, I, can, I can definitely say that. Um, I have good days and I have bad days and I have days that come out of nowhere that um, not sure what the, the instigator is. But overall with you know, the steady and committed um, path, I guess, like trying new things. Um, I was unable to be without IV antibiotics um, until I did um, the disulfiram treatment. That treatment moved me farther along in my healing, especially after dealing with the mold um, to the point where I have not been having uh, pancreatic attacks anymore. So, um, you know, I really want to say for those of you that are still in the healing process, like don't, don't give up. Um, there's new things coming out all the time and not that everything works the same for every person. I, I do feel like there are going to be more options in front of us. Um, as we move forward. And so like my, my biggest message to everybody there is like, I've been where you are um, and, and I've made progress and I've tried many different things. And, and I know like what worked for me didn't necessarily work for my daughter. What worked for my husband didn't necessarily work for me. What worked for me didn't necessarily work for my son or vice versa. So like even within a family, um, our paths to healing were very, very different and, and we had to be really adaptable um, to the different options that were in front of us. So, um, you know, from a physical standpoint, um, I'm healing from an emotional standpoint. Um, I, I've healed a lot over the years as well. Um, acknowledging the losses, loss of career, loss of self, loss of um, independence, loss of, um, um, all that we could have had, you know, is, as far as a family, the, the family I imagined I would have, um, cause my children were so young when I got sick. Um, there's a lot of loss there and that, that requires healing as well. Um, which led me, um, to advocacy. Like I know the the minute I was well enough. And I remember laying on the couch, looking out the window and just crying, you know, like um, really struggling to um, not that I didn't want to be here, but I was suffering so much. And, and maybe I didn't touch that 
enough, but like I was on narcotic pain medicines for years because it was the only thing that was being thrown at me from my doctors. Like they didn't know what was wrong with me. They knew I was in pain. I was hospitalized for pain over and over and over again. Um, because of the major surgeries I had, like they had no qualms throwing pain medicine at me, but pain medicine wasn't fighting the line. Um, and I remember when I finally got, you know, to that point, um, that I could do something outside of myself. Like all I wanted to do was help others. And so that's, uh, that's why I founded Colorado Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Association um, because the resources we needed as a family and as individuals, they just weren't there when we needed them. Um, and, you know, perspective is I, I left my job in 2008 and um, got diagnosed and I was sick for a couple of years while I still had my career, but I got diagnosed in 2013. So, um, you know, it was a lot of years of, of fighting and healing and, um, and fighting again and fighting again and fighting again and finding that, um, you know, ability to keep moving forward, not only for myself, but for my kids that were struggling and my husband that was struggling as well. Um, so advocacy is, is, um, where my heart pulled me. And with that, um, founded COTBDAA in 2016, um, to elevate the level of awareness of tick-borne diseases, including Lyme disease in Colorado, which is a hard sell because our state just doesn't acknowledge that, um, Lyme disease is an endemic problem. Um, our mission is to raise awareness through education, prevention, research, advocacy, and patient support. Um, on the education side of things, um, when we first started, we were holding in-person forums where we were bringing in speakers from uh, across the country, well-known doctors and other advocates um, and specialists. Um, we um, have been involved with the meetups that have been hosted by um, not only Billy, but um, Joanne and Jody. We have created a web page and have just recently up updated our web page to include as much relevant um, data to Colorado um, as possible. Because I, I did find as I was looking at resources across the country, not everything that's out there is, is relevant to our region. And so trying to, to make a regionally relevant um, place or access to information was really important. We provided TikToks, uh, Colorado TikToks. So I've had the doors opened at my former um, employers and associated agencies. So the US Forest Service, the BLM, the National Park Service, Colorado State um, Wildlife, uh, Parks and Wildlife, um, being able to go in and educate my peers, um, my fellow coworkers, the wildland firefighters that are you know, getting posted all over the country. Um, giving them that education that just wasn't a part of my career education. Um, getting to do PSAs and news media, uh, whether it's on the radio or newspaper, um, just getting the word out there. And the one interesting thing that I have found is that since COTBDAA um, was formed, the number of reported cases from the state to the CDC has increased. And I can't say it's all due to us, but I'm hoping that awareness has led to better um, uh, informed public, people that are um, getting tested more and, and um, able to access care more um, frequently, that maybe that is why our numbers are going up a little bit is awareness because I think Lyme has always been here um, to the level that it probably is today and maybe even more so, but it just hasn't been recognized. Like I said, it took three and a half years for me to get a primary care doctor to even order a test, even with all my risk factors. 
So um, I just wanted to add that little piece of info in there. Um, other part of our mission is prevention. So we do offer prevention brochures and posters, um, getting those into schools. I've gotten them into um, our local hospital. Um, every year in May, we, we do a big push for prevention. Um, ticks are active year round, but um, tick season is upon us and has been upon us and will be upon us um, tick season um, for at least the next few months. And so, that opportunity to boost that awareness uh, with, with May just around the corner, May, Lyme and tick-borne disease awareness, we really try to get our resources out to people. And, and prior to COVID, we were doing a lot of in-person um, informational booths at different um, venues that would, that would invite us. So the Colorado Get Outdoors Day with the uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, um, different local events, um, and anywhere that would invite us or we could get into, we were going and we were trying to spread that education to children as well with some of the games you can see here on this slide. Um, again, PSAs and news media and Colorado TikToks, um, prevention is the only way to avoid a tick-borne disease. So we, we stress that very highly. Um, research, because I was a wildlife biologist with the US Forest Service, um, I went from studying glamorous animals like lynx and goshawks and um, boreal toads to parasites. So I, I transferred when I was able to, I, was, I transferred my, my expertise into the world of vectors. Um, and just last year was able to publish, um, I was a co-author of um, Ticks and Tipperine Diseases of Colorado. And I did this with, um, a couple of partners from USDA as well as CSU. And what we did is we produced uh, a manuscript that is basically a, a review of all tick species in Colorado, anything that shows up in the literature, anything that shows up in um, archives. Um, and we found that we have about 28 different species of, of ticks in Colorado um, and a number of them uh, almost the majority of them are important as not only um, medical, medically important for humans, but veterinary importance too for our pets and, and wildlife. So our collaborators, and we're so grateful for them, um, Dr. Heather Zerlong from Technology has been a collaborator in identifying some of um, the ticks that Bird Conservation of the Rockies, also a collaborator for us, has been collecting off of migratory birds. So we've been doing that since um, 2016 or 17, I'll have to check my dates. But um, we've collected a number of ticks. Um, and what's interesting about some of the ticks we've been collecting is that they are considered nidiculous ticks, which is a new vocabulary word for me, meaning that the tick would, would stay very close to um, their host nest, but these nidiculous ticks, we're, we're collecting off of migratory birds. So these birds are transporting these ticks way away from their nests. Um, and um, some of these ticks are incredibly uh, competent vectors for Lyme bacterium in Colorado. So um, we hope as the years go on that we're able to collect more data um, and, and show that just because we, we may not have um, an endemic population of black-legged tick, we do have endemic populations of some other competent tick vectors that can transmit uh, Lyme disease in addition to the number of the other pathogens. And, um, and key to this is that, you know, unfortunately, the state of Colorado doesn't do any active surveillance. They, they only do passive surveillance and they're not doing any testing um, on ticks either. So pathogen data is, is really limited in our state. Um, so the importance for research. Um, advocacy, um, this is huge. And we work really closely with a number of other organizations, um, 
departments, um, line groups, because the more you work together, um, the more you can accomplish. And so I've become a member of the Public Tick Integrative Pest Management Working Group. It's a, a work of, um, or a, a group of professionals, advocates, researchers, scientists, um, pest management um, applicators uh, that meet once a month and discuss a new topic and um, produce different um, tick pest alerts. It, it's an integrative group trying to problem solve. Um, I was also a subcommittee member for the Health and Human Services Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. Um, the working group has been through two sessions now, um, turning in reports to Congress in 2018 and then again in, well, it was supposed to be in 2020, but I don't think the report actually got in until January this year. Um, being a subcommittee member allowed me to work um, with a wide variety of um, researchers, um, special interests, CDC, um, and other advocates so that the patient voice could get through in these reports and that um, items that were important, um, especially for our region were voice. Like I, I felt good that I had a voice to some level um, in, in being a part in writing these subcommittee reports. Um, I've also been working as a programmatic panel member for the Department of Defense's Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, uh, Tick-Borne Disease Research Program. This is my first year doing it. We just got through the first round and this allows patient voice to determine which research um, gets funded through the DOD for these particular um, um, proposals. And so um, I'll be doing that for the next three years. And there, there is opportunity as well for um, patient voice to be heard uh, through the consumer review process. And so if anybody is interested in that, if they do put a call out again this year, please just let me know. Um, uh, it does require a lot of review. It, it it um, requires some writing, uh, um, you know, so making sure that whatever advocacy you're, you're ready for is something that you're able to take on. Um, I know I took on a little bit too much before I was healed enough and, and I paid for it. So um, there are things you can do today and then there's things you can do down the road, but um, we're partners with Center um, for Lyme Action and we have participated. I, I got to go to Washington DC last year. Uh, this year it was all virtual, but we participated in the DC fly-in, which is where um, we meet with our representatives and um, senators um, asking for um, them to support appropriations for increased Lyme disease research. And I can say that the work we did nationwide as advocates definitely increased, I think it was by 65% Lyme disease research monies um, at the federal level. And um, Jody participated this year as well, virtually, and um, we're hoping for even greater numbers coming in of uh, 2022 appropriations. Um, I serve as a board member for the Mothers Against Lyme uh, it's a new group that has uh, rallied to try to get recognition of um, not only pediatric Lyme, but congenital Lyme. Um, I'm, I, if you haven't heard, uh, the CDC has formally come out and um, acknowledged that although they say uh, cases are rare, that transmission between mother and child is possible for Lyme. And we know that it's possible for many of the other tick-borne diseases as well. So. Um, LIMEX is an innovation partnership. It's a partnership between the Alexandra, um, oh, excuse me, I just lost my train of thought. Um, it's a public-private partnership. Um, the Cohen Foundation and, um, and HHS have partnered now, and I'll be learning more about that, how that partnership is going to be working in the next month, so I can provide an update on that later. Um, but basically having patient voice and patient experience 
guide where um, research goes and innovation for research. Um, I've recently become a member of the public, um, or excuse me, the Wildlife Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, trying to devise a strategy for um, how wildlife fits into tick-borne disease and tick-borne prevention and, and the treatments that are out there. Locally, I'm a member of the Chaffee County Health Coalition. And so I'm able to spread awareness in my local community through those connections. Um, and then as a whole, um, May is coming up and it's Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Month. Um, for the past four years, we've gotten the governor's proclamation, first with um, Governor Hickenlooper and then with um, Governor Paulus. Um, we're hoping, I've got fingers crossed, that we will be hearing soon that um, Governor Paulus has, has granted us the proclamation for 2021. And so, you know, as far as advocacy goes, um, everybody can be involved. And I, and I really encourage everybody to be involved, even if it's just telling your story. Like it, if, if you share that with somebody else, um, you never know how your story is going to impact somebody else or the path that they're on. I would not got, I would not have gotten diagnosed at all. I probably wouldn't even, even gone down the path of Lyme disease if somebody hadn't shared their story with me. Um, so I, I really feel like it's just incredibly important for, for sharing of stories, especially in the month of, of May, to increase that awareness and increase our community's awareness and increase our state's awareness, which will benefit everybody um, nationally and, and, um, and locally. Um, so patient support, last but not least, um, we have partnered, that's an announcement, um, Jody and Joanne um, and Colorado Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Association have partnered so that we can provide um, um, more unified and, and, um, and a source of patient support in one place. So really, really happy to, to join forces with these incredible women um, and, um, and really grateful they gave me the chance to talk to everybody today too. So um, you can join us. So Colorado Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Association has a website, a Facebook site, a Twitter site, an Instagram site. Colorado Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Support Group also has a Facebook site, which I'm not sure everybody on the meetup is aware of. That site is private. That's a great place for everybody to be able to speak freely, privately, and safely in a really supportive environment. The Facebook page for Colorado uh, Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Association is more of a public place, um, not for that same kind of intimate interaction, but for information sharing. Um, but we're going to join, we're going to be crossing over with some of those resources so that um, new things that are, are coming down the line um, are available to everybody. Um, and then the meetups, of course, which we're all on today. So um, one other important piece of this is, um, and I've, I've kind of stressed this throughout, is working together helps others. So we have community partners that we're recognizing because these are the companies, the organizations, the groups that um, we have worked really closely with. They've supported us financially so that we can get out and do things because we are a 100% nonprofit, no paycheck, um, all volunteer organization. But these businesses um, have been incredible partners in supporting our efforts, not only for um, patient education, but prevention um, and the other activities that we conduct. So I wanted to say thank you to them. Um, and then last but not least, I was given the opportunity through our public, um, our Chaffee County um, Health Organization um, to share my story in a format that um, I wasn't quite quite ready for, I had to use some um, ar artistic talent that was way, 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 way hidden. But um, I did have the opportunity to share my story locally and it's now on YouTube um, 
as as a piece of awareness and i'd like to play it for you today if it plays well if it doesn't we'll cancel it you can you can watch it on your own um but i will press play and we'll see what happens How did I get here? You were asleep for years as I flourished. You waited, and when my defenses were down and no one was watching, you unleashed your power. You waged a war, but you do not play by any rules. Your Trojan horse, so small, goes undetected by most that fall prey to your assaults. Just one little bite. You fooled so many into believing you do not exist. Coward, you hide in the darkness or fade to the background with your camouflage. You took my strength, my sanity. You left me teetering on the edge. You sucked my energy. You drained my heart, my tears, my passion, my muscles, my mind. You consumed me with fatigue and pain and rage. Your attacks continued in unpredictable waves. Though I felt you coming at times, still shocked at how quickly and devastatingly you could strike. You laugh in my face, you mock me. Year after year, my defenses were weakened. Was I dying? Some thought I had, my family feared I would. There were days I wished I could. You taunted me over and over, sucking me into the illusion of triumph. Then you would strike again and again and again. So many unsuspecting victims in your wake. You are relentless. You are devious and heartless. You attacked my family. You stole from me and my children. You masked this mother, wife, and friend. Even I could not recognize the host you invaded. Have I become invisible? I pretend you have no impact, smiling through the pain, the loss, a facade that I perfected. It took years to flesh you out, to identify you, with imperfect science and a dogma that denies your true nature. You alienated me from my soul, my joy, my family, my friends my dreams, my voice for a time. So many years and scars, but I am back. I am a natural survivor. Stronger and smarter, I now bend without breaking. Be warned, I am coming for you. I will never give up. And I have joined forces with the masses of wounded you attempted to break. Masses that are growing in number, strength and focus to expose and defeat you. We have revealed you. We are all coming for you. Um, I wanted to share that with you because um, I just, I can't stress how important sharing your own personal story um, is to, to helping the greater good, not only the people that are already impacted. Um, sorry, I get a little bit emotional. 
um, but also the people that have not yet been impacted. Um, you know, Lyme and tick-borne diseases are growing into, you know, even within my own family and extended family, um, so many more people have been impacted since I got sick than prior and in sharing your story um, you just never know who you might touch. And I was so grateful to my um, local health department that they gave me this opportunity. They, they invited me to join the storytelling workshop. And I, I can tell you, you might've heard a little bit of anger in the video. Um, through that storytelling workshop, I was able to um, let go of so much that I had been holding on to because I was too busy trying to get well, get my children well, um, advocate for others. I really wasn't paying very much attention to my own um, needs or losses or pain. And so um, not only can you help somebody else, but you can help yourself in the, in the process as well. So with that, I will take questions. Monica, thank you so much. That was, I have not seen that. That was very profound. And <laughs> I also have, my yeah, my nose is running too. So, um, you know, that, that was, uh, thank you for saying what I think so many of us feel. All right. We do have a number of questions. So the first question is from Elise. Um, this is going back to the insurance, uh, that you taught, you taught, uh, you touched on. And her question is, are you saying I could maybe get my uncovered live doctor covered with an appeal? And then she notes she does have Medicare. Um, unfortunately, I don't have um, the experience with appeals with Medicare because my primary insurance is Federal Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, however, again, you know, with um, the medical bill gurus who are some of our partners, they do that for their business and. Um, I believe the way it works is the only way they collect anything from you is if they collect something from your insurance company. Um, and so that, that is a resource um, that is out there to look into. I have not appealed Medicare for anything because I haven't had to, but um, you know, with a lot of the other um, primary insurance plans, um, that, uh, that appeal process is, is in place. So um, I would encourage it. Thank you. Joanne will be fielding the next question. So the next question is from Bobby. He wants to know if you have any knowledge with more gallons or have any insight on that. I don't, that wasn't one of our family's issues. And so I, I don't have, um, background on that disease. Um, the next question was another question from Elise, where she was asking how she could get involved. How can she help? Yes, um, you know, in, in a world of non-COVID, <laughs> um, we relied really heavily on um, volunteers for a lot of our work. Um, and I, I do wanna just place a shout out there to um, Sharon Austin, and Jen Leon and Nancy Wrigley, um, Jillian Tosta. Um, we, we had so many volunteers that were helping us when we were, we were holding our in-person events. Um, and, and that's a, a big place you can get, get involved with COTBDA directly with through prevention um, activities. A, a lot of times we would do those in the front range or other places where we'd have to meet and disseminate information. So hopefully we'll get back to those days again when we can do that. Um, but in the meantime, um, helping even just by spreading um, social media, um, the posts that are coming off of um, our, our webpage or our Facebook page or Twitter, or whatever social media you're in, spreading that awareness every time you spread your sharing with somebody else. That's really, really helpful. Um, we, um, as I've developed a lot of connections in my local community, I would love to see that same 
um, connection being built in every community so that um, that information is being shared in, in every county, in every city, in every school across Colorado. So if those are some of the places you have interest in or expertise in, um, I would love to work with, with other people that want to get that information out to their local local areas too. Colorado is a huge state and um, to have that level of influence, you really have to have people that are involved in the community doing that kind of outreach. And so I think the more of us um, statewide that have the ability and that interest to do so, um, to start sharing those resources that I've done here locally out to other communities. And, and I, I'm not saying I've only done it locally, I've been in other communities as well. Um, but the more we can get that out there, the more we can get that spread, the better. Um, as far as the other organizations, the, the DC Fly-In, um, they look for advocates every year to, to meet with our representatives um, and to be a part of, of advocating for um, increased funding for Lyme disease. That's something everybody can be a part of if they wish. It's it was a little intimidating, I can say, the first time I did it, um, especially in person. Um, but then I think it was maybe a little bit um, intimidating as well. This year, being virtual without having had that experience prior. But now there's a number of us in Colorado that have that experience that can um, assist when new people are joining into how to go about doing that. Um, anywhere you can share information. So if, if, you, if you are interested in doing any of those things or you want more information about how you can help in other areas, I'd be happy to talk to you and um, you can reach me. Well, I can, I can put my email in here somewhere. Great, I'll put your email in here for everybody okay. um, after, I, after I ask you this next question. Elise has another question for you and uh, she'd like to know how you went about remediating the mold in your house. Very poorly. Um, I can say um, that was a whole other can of worms that got opened, um, not only in discovering we had mold but then how to treat it properly. And we did not. In fact, that's what led to um, an incredible decline in my health because um, I had reached a certain level with Lyme treatment. And then when we discovered mold was part of the problem and we went to remediate, um, I, I trusted our local company to know what they were gonna, you know, to know that they were doing the right thing and were gonna be safe by me. And I got an incredibly toxic exposure during the process. Um, so I would not remediate your house the way we did. Uh, we learned the hard way. Um, you need really, really experienced and um, diligent and careful people working in your home. Um, testing that we did, we, we used a number of different um, testing companies, real-time labs, molecular uh, emulytics, and, um, and then we had a, a um, air quality tester out of Denver come to our home as well. But we had two different remediation companies and we basically had to gut the rooms that were impacted by mold and start over. And I was not able to actually live in my home for about nine months. Work um, not only, um, um, extreme sensitivity to mold, but also extreme um, uh, multiple chemical sensitivities too, which I'm still dealing with. So um, if you are going to remediate, um, you need a company that knows ex you know, exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and, and I don't know who to send you to. Um, even after we leave this and my house is not healthy enough for me, so we are gonna be leaving. But um, even though it came back okay on the, on the air quality test, like I'm still not okay in my house. So um, tens and thousands of dollars and we still have to move. And I know my doctor said move, you know, right, right off the bat. Um, but at that time I couldn't even fathom moving out of our home. Like, the reality of, of what that means for certain patients doesn't hit until you 
you've been through what we've been through. So. Okay, we have a question from, sorry here, um, Heather, I'm sorry, one second here. Sure. And Heather would like to know what are all the other things you were infected with and how did your doctors detect them? Okay. Um, so when I was initially tested, um, I was PCR positive with Lyme disease. I was antibody positive with anaplasmosis. Um, I was clinically diagnosed with Babesia and clinically diagnosed with Bartonella. My children and husband were positive for Bartonella, but I wasn't, but my symptoms were clinically significant for Bartonella. Um, and I was tested through Igenix for um, all of, for Lyme uh, co-infections. I went to Galaxy Diag Diagnostics for Bartonella as well, still didn't have a positive Bartonella test. And then um, recently within the past year, I retested through Igenix because the one benefit, and I do want to say this in case people are not aware, Medicare does cover Igenix testing. Um, there's only a couple of tests that Igenix offers that is that are not covered by Medicare, but the majority of the tick-borne disease testing is covered by Medicare but through Igenix. So if you have Medicare, it is a great source for testing. Um, it's a great source for testing even if you don't, but it's uh, we do understand um, personally how expensive it can be. Um, so when I was retested just recently, they, they were offering tests that weren't offered seven years ago when I got tested initially. And I tested positive for Babesia duncani, um, duncani as well as tick-borne relapsing fever, um, in addition to the Lyme. And, um, so I felt, um, really grateful that my doctor clinically diagnosed me with Babesia because the only Babesia I had been tested for earlier was Microti and I didn't have Microti, I had Duncani, um, which also explains why it was more um, resistant to treatment as well. Duncani is, is, um, is much more resistant to treatments than, than Microti is. So, um, so that's how I found out about the tick-borne pathogens um, and Bartonella, which may or may not have been tick-borne. But um, I also saw an immunologist that did testing um, and I got reactivated EBV um, and parvovirus and a number of other viruses, which I believe are probably the problem for a number of uh, Lyme patients that end up with more chronic and complex illnesses. Is, um, the viral load um, uh, for a number of those different um, infections, you could have reactivations. And I know that was the case for me as well. And probably with the mold exposure that just boosted everything to the surface as well. So um, those were the sources. I mean, I, I did get testing done through LabCorp. And I think for the first time ever, I had a positive band um, just this last year through LabCorp, but all the way along, I've been negative through LabCorp, so. Can I just ask you, what um, what did you do to heal the mold besides the stuff in your house? Like, did you take any supplements for the mold? And also, could you talk more? I've never heard of anaplasmosis and what did you do to heal that? And sure. the parvovirus. Sure. So anaplasmosis is um, another tick-borne um, illness. And unfortunately, it's like one of the top co-infectors um, that black-legged ticks are carrying. Um, and it um, contributed to lower white cell counts in my blood. So that was kind of the in fact, I went to my doctor and I asked him, I said, could I have anaplasmosis? Because my white cell counts and neutrophil counts were so low. And, um, you know, the answer at that time was he, he didn't know what it was, but it is another tick-borne disease um, that is common in the black-legged ticks. So if you're bitten by a tick that's carrying Lyme, um, depending on which part of the country you're in, um, 
anaplasmosis is a, a significant co-infection. Um, for that, uh, doxycycline is the, the frontline antibiotic for that one as well. Um, but I did a number of, of different treatments for um, the anaplasmosis. Um, for mold, in addition to remediating our house, um, I did, oh my gosh, I, I can't even tell you how much I did. I did um, nasal sprays. Um, I did um, cholestyramine. I did charcoal, um, well call, other binders to bind the, the mold toxins and get them out of my body. Um, really avoidance was huge. So not being in situations where I was getting more exposure was really important. And I mean, I'm still very, very sensitive. I can walk into a building and know very quickly whether there's mold or other chemical. Um, and that's the part that's getting harder for me to differentiate the more I've healed is, is it mold or is it a chemical that I'm responding to because I have both sensitivities now. Um, but like I said, I couldn't even sleep in my house for, for months. Um, I'm sleeping in my house now, but I, I know that it's probably contributing to me not getting better. As far as the reactivations of um, the viruses, I, I do take um, suppressive medicine for, um, for EBV and, um, you know, it's hard to say when something's high or low on a given day, but um, I do take uh, antivirals for suppression. So. The next question is from Bobby and his question is, has anyone researched broken down the how of the 6% cured of chronic LD in the .orgs survey? I don't know if you're aware of that. Right. Can you read, can you say that again? Okay, so what Bobby's asking is, has anyone researched and broken down the how of the 6% that the .org survey from uh, LD, I guess, of the 6% cured of chronic LD in the .org's survey. I'm not familiar with what you're talking about, I'm sorry. Okay, okay our next question is from Michelle. Hi, thanks so much for speaking and sharing today. You mentioned building a house. Do you have a contractor you're working with who is mold conscious? And what materials are you structuring your home from? I've been seeing hemp, cret, earth bag, unsure best way to move forward with a home build. Thanks so much, Michelle. Absolutely, yeah, we've, we've been trying to build for a really long time. Um, and in our community that's booming, it's been really hard because we um, builders have not been accessible. I am working with a builder um, that is retiring when we are done um, because of all the things that I've asked to be done with our house. Um, I don't think there are a lot of builders out there that are very um, mold educated. Um, and so he has, um, he has agreed to do the things that I want done on the house. We are using um, wood instead of, you know, particle board for the subfloors. We are using wood instead of drywall. We are using um, insulation that has no binders or formaldehyde. Um, we are doing a stucco finish, but we're um, installing a rain screen, which isn't a common practice here um, in the so-called arid West. Um, you know, because the belief is that because we live in Colorado, we can't possibly have a mold issue because we're so dry. But um, I've been educating our builder quite a bit and the materials, every material that's being used on my house is something that I have cleared for not only VOCs, but also um, either mold resistance or um, mold susceptibility. So, um, I've been carefully choosing the, the products that I'm using on my home and how 
the construction is actually going. So um, it has been a consuming process and um, not a very pleasant process working with a, a well-established builder, but um, we're getting closer. We're, we're starting to see the light. So, um, and I'm hoping that all of us in our family will start feeling better when we're in a healthy environment. We are gonna be installing um, also an air exchange system in our house. So the air that's coming into our house will be filtered and then um, the bad air will get expelled. Um, and, and so hopefully that will, that will help us. And I've been actually painting, like I'm, I'm using a zero toxin paint, not even just a low VOC paint, but zero toxic paint, um, Ecos brand um, for painting the wood that we're gonna be putting up on the walls. Um, so like houses used to be built, you know, out of, out of wood, we've done that with our home. We, we don't have any of the um, manufactured or engineered wood. Um, even in the floor joists or in the um, in the ceiling joists, um, so um, that's that's how we're approaching it. And I looked at a lot of different options, and um, I'm sure we've made some mistakes along the way, but it's going to be better than where we're at. So. And I have a question to that, just because I think other people might be interested. How did you determine what materials to use and where did you access those? For instance, low VOC paints, the different kind of wood that you're using? Yeah, I, I found a great website. It's called My Chemical Free House. And um, somebody has dedicated um, themselves to compiling lists of different products. And um, even within the products that this person lists on their webpage, I still had to do some outside um, investigations. Um, green home building is another one you, you have to pay to, to see the articles on their site, but that's where I, you know, investigated the rain screen for the stucco because a lot of, um, you know, Colorado is huge for stucco homes, but if you're not um, providing a place for moisture that may either enter through the stucco, uh, through a crack or whatever, or uh, condensation coming from the inside of the house. If you don't, if you don't reserve a place for that water to drain down the wall and out, then you can have failures there and and mold issues. And so, like I was adamant. My builder thought I was crazy, but I was adamant. And it, maybe it is overkill, and that's okay. I'd rather have overkill and have a dry, um, safe house um, than then have a chance for that moisture buildup to occur. Because if, if a house isn't breathing well, then um, you know your mold can be hidden in the walls or you can't see it. And, and until you gut your house, you don't know you've got a problem. So, um, but that's, uh, my Chemical Free House is a, a website that I, I um, frequently reference to. And I, I can see that she's been updating a lot of her stuff there, um, Ecos paint we could order. It's a little bit more expensive, but we, we've been using it and it goes a long way. So, um, you know, lots of good ideas there. Some you have to test out for yourself and others like I'm trusting will be okay because I don't have another alternative. This next question is from Madison. She first wants to say, hi, I just want to start by saying I was really moved by this talk. Just the things in your family, you and your family went through. I can't even imagine. And I'm moved by your everyday strength. Her question is, hi. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, I just moved to Colorado from upstate New York for a job in animal pharmaceutical cells. So my job is not only to prevent tick-borne diseases in animals, but also prevent the disease, the disease ticks being brought in by pets mm -hmm. and transmitting. Hold on, I scrolled too fast, sorry. Um, not only, okay, sorry guys, I lost my place. By pets and transmitting the ticks to their owners. Can you tell me a little bit about the tick situation in Colorado? Are they common? Which ones are the most problematic in the state? I know ticks are everywhere in upstate New York, 
and I am trying to learn a little more about them here in Colorado. Um, one, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for doing what you're doing, which is awesome. Um, yeah, so through the, the process of, of um, co-authoring the manuscript that was published, um, there are a number of ticks in, in Colorado, like, I mean, 28 different species, and we had um, records of, of certain species in Colorado. Um, from the state's website, from the passive surveillance that they do, the um, Rocky Mountain wood tick and American dog tick are the two most prevalent ticks in Colorado um, based on their um, surveillance data. Um, they have also um, shown populations or, or occurrence, I'm not gonna say populations, um, occurrence of the uh, brown dog tick as well as a couple of records from probably four different records of the Lone Star Tick, which they're not saying are established yet, but there's enough records there that I hope somebody's starting to look because it's an incredibly invasive tick species. The ones that they don't talk about, and we talk about on our webpage, so if you go to coloradoticks.org, there's a whole section on ticks and the individual ticks and what we know about them in the state um, based on the information we could find through research as well as information that we collected. So um, there are several different Ixodi species that are competent vectors of many of the um, Lyme bacteriums. So the Ixodes spinipalpus, the Ixodes angustus, um, are the two that I have the most concern about in addition to the soft body ticks. So we have the Onithodorus hermsii and Parkeri um, in Colorado. And you know, for a lot of people, I think it's it's um they're sneaky little ticks because um they don't act or behave the same way the hard body ticks do that most of us are familiar with. And um they transmit tick-borne relapsing fever, which when it, you know, the onset of the disease can look very much like Lyme and even the, um, the later stage disease can look very much like Lyme. Um, and it has this relapsing nature to it as well. And so like, for instance, my, my son, um, I know when he had his first acute, um, exhibition of that disease because we had him in the ER. Um, we didn't know what was wrong with him at the time. Like it was retrospect, but um, we went into a movie theater when he came out. He, I mean, two hours we're in the movie theater, perfectly healthy when he went in, when we came out, he was hot, burning up, complaining that his neck hurt, his knees hurt, and he was having trouble breathing. Um, we did take him to the ER they diagnosed him with flu or, or viral, even though he tested negative for flu, they never took his blood work. And so that febrile period that he had was very short lived. It was about a half an hour in length. The fever kind of went down and then it came back. And for like weeks, it would just do that. Um, and so like the, the soft body ticks in Colorado, I think are a really um, sneaky and stealth source of infection for a number of people, especially if you're living in um, or vacationing to or staying near um, rustic lodging facilities that either have had, currently have, or have had in the past infestations of mice, squirrels, chipmunks, or other rodents, um, and in some cases, bats. So, um, so in Colorado, you know, the, the most prevalent tick-borne or tick species you will you encounter are going to be the Rocky Mountain wood tick or the, um, the uh, American dog tick, but there's a whole slew of other um, ticks out there that can be a problem not only for humans, but also for pets. Um, so I encourage you to go to Colorado Ticks and, and take a look and see, see what we've got there.
So Monica, I have a question and I think a lot of people might be interested in this. On the medical bill gurus that you mentioned mm -hmm. for people to use, yes. do you have any information on them or can you elaborate more on how they do things, what they charge? Do, you have, do they have a website that we could post for everybody to see? Yeah, they're one of our community partners. So if they go to our webpage, there's a link to their um, to their um, webpage as well. And then I have a um, information sheet I will send to you, Joanne, that you could get out to the group leader that talks about um, who they are and what they do. And um, you know, to to sum it all up, is they do the work that um, patients may not have the ability to do for themselves to try to seek out um, financial reimbursement for those things that are just not covered, you know, um, or insurance companies are not wanting to pay on. That's, that's what they specialize in doing is recovering those fees. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, before I ask the next question, I just wanted to call out, Heather had uh, posted here on the chat in case you haven't noticed um, about a, an air purifier that is scientifically proven to kill mold, allergens and COVID. Uh, the company is asapbolera.com. She's happy to send you the link. Um, she did put in her email, at least did ask um, Heather, if you can post that link here in chat, that would be great. If not, please email Heather directly for those details. Thank you for sharing that, Heather. Yeah, and I, I forgot to add, that was something else we did do um, after the remediation in our home is we bought about $1,500 um, worth of Austin Air um, home uh, air purifiers um, to help help you know, get our air quality better in our home. So. All right, this next question is from Lynn. Lynn wants to know, are there areas of Colorado which are worse than others for ticks? How pre prevalent are they in Denver? That's, that's a good question. Um, you know, unfortunately, because um, the, the state isn't doing, um, active surveillance, it's hard to say what the prevalence, we, we can say where ticks are known to you know, be at um, based on veterinary submissions, but we can't actually talk about prevalence. And what I have found um, through my own experience and, and through the experience of other people is that um, the prevalence of ticks is, is spotty um, and varied across the state. So, um, you know, they're locally, I know the drainages that are known for ticks. And so I avoid them in the springtime. Um, I don't know that about the rest of the state because that, 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 prevalence data, that surveillance just isn't being done. Um, and so, um, you know, in general, um, well-used trails where there's a lot of um, brush or, or tall grasses along the trails, riparian areas, um, tend to be areas that ticks are going to aggregate on because they're, for the most part, most ticks are, are passive questers. So they will, you know, hang on to the, the edge of a, a grass blade or a shrub leaf waiting for an animal or um, warm body of some sort, whether that be human or animal to, to walk by. Um, when you get into ticks like the Lone Star tick, they're more aggressive um, questers. So they'll actively move towards um, warmth or odor or CO2 um, more readily. So um, as far as giving you like where are the safe places to hike and where should you avoid, that's really hard to do because the data is just not there for Colorado, which is very unfortunate. Does anyone have any more questions for Monica today? I don't see any more in the chat. No, nothing. Okay, well, thank you so much, Monica, for joining us. We really appreciate your time today and all your valuable information. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so glad I could be here today. Thank you. Thank you everybody for attending today. Thanks guys. Bye, take care.
Everybody enjoy the sunny day. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks. Was, you is too. this is this talk being recorded and is it um, going to be available? It yes. is. Yes, it is being recorded, and uh, we will have it posted tomorrow on Meetup, and then Joanne will post it on Facebook. Okay, and what's the Facebook group again? Who is this speaking right now? Oh, it's Heather. Heather, you know what? I will, I saw your email. Yeah. And I took a picture of it. I will invite okay. you to that group. Okay, awesome. Thank yeah, you. For, for all of you who did get your emails out there, um, Joanne will get you invited to the Facebook group. And then for those of you that asked about next month's conference, please go to the meetup page. You will see both days posted there. And that is where you will RSVP just like you did for this one. You'll get in the link for the Zoom and uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Yeah, and I, I did wanna say register early since it is a limited um, capacity, so. Awesome. All, right. All right, everybody, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Happy right. Sunday. <laughs> Bye-bye.